Hello and welcome everybody to ICMDA webinars. I'm Dr. Peter Saunders, the Chief Executive of the International Christian Medical and Dental Association. And uh, today we're delighted to have Dr. Anil Chirian speaking to us on mobilizing doctors for healthcare mission. But the questions we're looking at today are, are what are the strategic challenges of mobilizing Christian healthcare professionals, especially with the shift of the center of global Christianity to the majority of the world, the so-called global South? What about the North-South missionary divide that's shaping global missions and the Lausanne movement? We are going to discuss how we can adapt and reframe mission strategies, and Dr. Neil will present a new vision, a paradigm shift in our thinking on global mission that incorporates the changing realities of today's world and its implications on mobilizing Christian health workers for global missional health care. Uh, Dr. Neil is a medical doctor who graduated initially from Christian Medical College in Valor, India in 1989. He began his medical career working in a, in a leprosy hospital and then various Christian mission hospitals. And in 1994, he qualified as a pediatrician, then uh, a master of public health in Manila and a diploma in health economics from uh, York. He shifted from clinical work to community health and development, then worked as the mission coordinator for EMFI, that's the Evangelical Medical Fellowship of India, the, one of the ICMDA affiliated groups there, training medical, dental and nursing students. And in 2014, Anil and his wife Shalini, who was an obstetrician gynecologist, moved to Africa to start the ICMDA National Institute of Health Sciences, Jongli, to train healthcare professionals for South Sudan and work closely with CMDA South Sudan and CMF of Uganda. Dr. Anil's been actively involved in other global health initiatives, including health systems research, and has received a number of awards for his work. Shalini and, and Anil have two sons, Ajay, who works as an architect in the US, and Rohan, who is undergraduate at the California Baptist University. So Anil, it's great to see you again. Uh, welcome back to ICMDA webinars, and we really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Peter. And once again, to, for allowing me to and inviting me to present today uh, on a topic which I think is important. So today I'm really going to talk about the topic of mobilizing workers for global mission and healthcare mission specifically. But to begin with, I want to make a disclaimer. This is more of a big picture kind of talk and uh, I will be talking about some of the general trends in the Christian world and also some strategic options. So there are not going to be many uh, specific uh, detailed ideas. Uh, and I hope uh, the people who joined this webinar will be happy with that. Uh, the talk also, as mentioned by Pete, Peter tries to have a relook at the way missional healthcare is being carried out. So, to begin with, I want to present and to together try to understand the changes in the Christian world. So, what we see is that there is a, a shift uh, in the Christian population around the world. And the Christian population has shifted to the majority world. And I put down the Protestant Christian population for the top 10 uh, countries. And what we see here is that uh, seven out of these uh, 10 countries are from the global uh, south, uh, from Africa, from Asia, and South America. Latin America. So this is a big change that has happened over the last 100 years. And for example, Nigeria uh, is one of the second largest 
Christian Protestant populations in the world. And in the brackets, what I've shown is the percentage uh, of the population of the country. Like Nigeria, 40% of the population is actually uh, Protestant Christians. If you add the Catholics, then it's a much bigger number, especially when you go to uh, South America. Uh, I presented this data in, uh, at the ICM Day World Congress, and uh, some people asked questions. So I went and rechecked. So uh, some of the countries that I rechecked the data was China, Kenya, UK, and India. So uh, China, for example, uh, though the world population review says there are 58 million Christians, uh, I found a more recent study which was done and uh, a survey and it showed that 2% of the Chinese population uh, claim to be uh, Christian and that amounts to around 29 uh, million. Similarly, I checked the, the data for Kenya, UK and India. UK, the numbers are declining, but still about 33% uh, of the population uh, by different surveys claim to be Protestant Christians. If you go and ask how many of them attend church, that's going to be a, a different uh, statistic. Uh, so if you look at the trend over the years and the Christians in the continent, when you look at the uh, Christians in the global north, we find that uh, at the beginning of 1900s, uh, there were about 459 million uh, Christians in the global uh, north. And uh, now, uh, for example, in 2000, it went up to 816 million and now 832 million. But when you look at the global south, you find that there is a huge transition uh, from 98 million at the beginning of 1900s to now it's almost 1.1712 1, million or 1.7 billion. And uh, so you find that in today, the largest population, Christian populations are found in Africa and then in Latin America and then Asia. So this is a big change. Now, when we look at uh, modern mission, and we find that uh, the number of missionaries have been uh, uh, declining uh, generally. In 1900s, though, it was about 62,000 missionaries. In 2020, it was around 425,000 missionaries. But the important uh, statistic to look at is that for every 1,220 Christians, there was one missionary uh, in 1900. But today, for every 6,000 uh, Christians, there's only one uh, missionary, cross-cultural uh, full-time missionary. So uh, it's a reduction by five times. Uh, in 2021, uh, only 53% came from the global north. That is from Europe, UK, and North America. And it is down from 88% in 1970s. So according to this article by uh, Julo in 2021, Brazil, South Korea, Philippines, and China send the largest number of missionaries today. So there's been a different shift uh, in the countries that are sending out missionaries. For example, the global north but still for every 4,000 Christians, one missionary is uh, being sent out. Whereas in the global North, it is still much less. Uh, only eight, for every 8,000 Christians, there is one uh, missionary. So what we find is that there is a North-South missionary divide. Uh, this uh, slide, the the chart is from uh, the Luzan movement. And it says that though uh, two thirds of the Christians in the world are in the South, they send out less than half the missionaries. 
while the proportion of Christians in the North is now only one third, they still send about 53%. So actually the South could send many, many more missionaries out into the rest of the world, especially in area countries of need. So I want to move on to look at the current trends and barriers that are reshaping global mission. So we've already talked about the shift of the center of Christianity from global north to global south, from USA, Europe to Asia, Africa, and South America. But with the declining number of missionaries, especially medical missionaries from the global north, there is currently a growing gap. And I've tried to call it an opportunity gap because it's an opportunity for others to come and fill in this gap. Uh, there is also a rise of the Pentecostal church, Pentecostalism and independent churches in Africa, South America, and Asia. And uh, somehow in the whole uh, traditional mission movement, the Pentecostal churches were never included in the societies uh, that were formed. So uh, this is one reality that we need to take, accept that there are a large number of independent churches, whereas the traditional mainline churches are usually are decreasing in numbers and many of them uh, have closed down, especially in Europe uh, and in England. The other reality is uh, globalization. And globalization has uh, had certain impact on the world today and one is migrant labors. So there is an increase in the movement of people from Africa, Asia, and South America to the global north for work and employment. Now, these are mainly skilled, but also some of them are unskilled refugees and migrant workers who come from fragile and poor countries. Now, this is a big shift. All over the world, we are seeing that people are moving across borders and even within countries, even in a country like India, uh, in earlier days, most of the Christians were located in the South, uh, whereas the mission fields were in the North of India. But today what's happening is uh, due to mig migrant labor, most of the people from the North are coming to the South looking for employment. And so you don't really have to send people out sometimes the mission fields are right in your own uh, neighborhoods and localities. So that is one uh, reality. The other one is most societies today are multicultural. And uh, so you will find that increasingly uh, no society can call themselves predominantly uh, Christian. So there are opportunities uh, right where you live to be engaged with and to be a missionary. Uh, technology has changed a lot. And the fact that today we are doing this webinar is uh, a testament to that, that there are advances in technology, travel, uh, telecommunication systems have changed, the social media has grown. And even when it comes to healthcare technology, uh, and now we have the whole challenge of artificial intelligence. And there is a big technology gap also between uh, the North and the South. And that is something we have to rec recognize. But many countries, for example, uh, around the world have grown in technology, Asia uh, particularly. Along with this, globalization has brought in many evils uh, like modern day slavery. There is a huge amount of human trafficking that is going on. Uh, and this is from everywhere, all around the world, and uh, different countries, uh, target countries. And then there is the problem of new colonization, uh, which is essentially an economic colonization. And uh, there is a huge amount of power in multinational companies. And so we see a lot of trends of because of this big companies like Amazon, uh, etc. and how it has changed the way people move around and find work. 
some of the barriers to global mission, uh, I just want to highlight two main areas, and that is the theological understanding of mission. And in this area, we, we, there is a need for convergence. Uh, and this comes out later on, I'll talk about the Luz Luzanne movement, but the God of the Bible is a God on mission. And so it's important that every believer in the church and every church becomes intentionally missional. Uh, it is not really an option for some believers, but it is for the whole church and every believer to be involved in God's mission. And the second is the dualism that has crept in, and that is the sac sacred secular divide. And this uh, pushes some areas of mission work, some ministries are not seen as, as important or relevant as others. Historical strategies and approaches, I think generally we have followed an elitist model of mission uh, based on St. Paul's uh, work. And uh, this has brought in a misalignment between the historical paradigm of mission and the biblical basis. I'll talk a little more on this. Uh, by the elitist nature, what I'm, I'm not referring to an attitude or a social status, but the specialized and professional status of uh, uh, missionaries. So we send a group of people and they are full-time cross-cultural missionaries. And then we have areas that we try to send them out like medical mission, educational mission, agricultural mission, et cetera, church planters. Now, uh, these are professionals and then they are sent out to a mission. So they carve out a certain uh, part of God's mission, but actually God's mission is only one. And there is a unity and there has to be a convergence uh, in the way we carry out mission. So mission is often seen uh, as what the church does out there through some people, some specialists, some full-time people called missionaries, rather than every believer or church asking, how do we get involved in God's mission? So we find that the original vision of uh, mission was as mandated by Christ and practiced by the early church somehow has changed. Uh, Christ gave the mission mandate to all believers and the whole church. Now, uh, some practical challenges also have crept in by the fact, by the elitist nature, global mission requires a lot of finances, a lot of preparation. Uh, we talk about sending missionaries to Bible college. Uh, when Shalini and I applied to many uh, mission organizations, we were told that we have to do three years of uh, Bible training and only then they would be willing to consider us. And uh, then there's the whole problem of maintaining missionaries. Once they come back from the mission field, how do you look after them? And uh, that has taken a lot of resources from certain uh, traditional mission organizations. There's a lack of mission sending organizations or systems for recruiting, e equipping, and maintaining overseas cultural missionaries in some parts of the world, especially the global south. Initiated by the famous evangelist, uh, I'm going to talk about the Luzan movement and, uh, and in global mission. This, the Luzan movement was initiated by uh, Billy Graham. And when he called Christian leaders from 151 countries, and it was launched in 1974. Uh, keeping up with this, it's become a movement, the initial uh, conference. And uh, there are world congresses held every 10 years. There's a global gathering and there are issue specific forums. Now, in some ways, the Luzanne movement galvanized the church towards global mission. And it did this through two things. One was the theological foundations of global mission. And this was established by one of the uh, chairs of one conference, uh, the famous uh, 
John Stott, evangelist John Stott. And the other important thing was the listing of unreached people groups. And this was done by Ralph Winters and the Center for World Mission. And uh, there was a refocusing of global mission on the ethne. Uh, previously, people had translated ethne as nations, whereas now it was understood that to be people groups rather than political or geographic regions. So this brought in a big shift uh, in the way people were approaching uh, mission, global mission. The Luzan movement connects people, it says influencers, and that's an important word in itself, but it does is by bringing them, bringing ideas forward. So it has diverse issue-based networks, and the idea is to catalyze new approaches and to look for new mission opportunities. Uh, it's tried to expand uh, and bring people across language barriers. I'm really glad that uh, today's ICMDA, we are exactly trying to do the same. And we are reaching out to the French Francophone countries and the Spanish speaking countries. And uh, we have translators for today's webinar, which is uh, excellent. And this is something that the Lausanne movement has tried to draw in because when you look at the Edinburgh conference, it was mainly English speaking people. The third is generations, and this is increasingly important to bring in people from all generations, and but also focusing on reaching out to young people, the youth, uh, because very often they don't participate in global mission conferences. The Lausanne conference, uh, sorry, just. Since 2010, at the Cape Town Lausanne Conference, there was an effort uh, to make the global mission movement broader in scope and to involve the whole church and to move away from the elitist model of or traditional cross cultural mission models. So, one of the outcomes of that was the formation of the Health for All Nations, a network, an issue based network. And uh, this has begun the process of reconciling missional healthcare with the wider scope of global mission. So it is now recognized as an issue-based network by the Luzan movement. Now, all this is good, but what is the implications in terms of medical mission today? So uh, medical mission, I prefer to use the word missional healthcare because as I said earlier, the word medical mission itself uh, sticks to the elitist kind of model of uh, mission. So the question really for us is, are we just Christian health professionals doing good quality health work in areas of need? Or do we do our medical work, whether it's hospitals, clinic, or whether it's community health or uh, training? How is it shaped by our understanding of uh, Missio Day, that this is God's mission? and the vision to see the kingdom of God come to fruition. If we allow the biblical understanding of healing, health and salvation to shape the way we provide or develop healthcare, then inevitably the scope of uh, missional healthcare will change. The other implication is that when we talk about missional healthcare against uh, hospitals and clinics, we are going to draw a whole lot of other people involved uh, who are necessary to bring about missional healthcare. Uh, going beyond doctors, dentists, nurses, which is the norm, to include physiotherapists, other allied health specialists, therapists, research scientists, nutritionists, psychologists, counselors, and then it could go on to accountants, agriculturists, economists. Really, uh, when we start mobilizing the wider church, and then we leverage the true pot potential talent of the church. Because if we are just limited to doctors, nurses, and dentists, then we are, we are limiting 
the scope of missional healthcare and the involvement of the church in missional healthcare. So uh, at this point, I just really want to, even when we look at ICM Day, uh, ICM Day mainly has membership from uh, doctors and dentists. Uh, and how do we bring in a wider, what is the platform or what is the area where we can draw in others to be involved uh, in missional health care? That is something that we need to reflect upon. Or how can we broaden the scope of the work that we are doing now? For example, in Africa, many of the countries don't strictly uh, limit their membership to uh, doctors and dentists. Uh, they have gone on. I, I was there at the meeting in Kenya where they decided to accept nurses and allied health workers. Uh, other uh, Christian fellowships have increasingly broaden their scope, but some have stuck to uh, doctors and dentists. I think here we are going to be missing out on a, a, a larger group because you, even if you take hospitals and healthcare facilities, we need accountants, we need administrators, we need a whole lot of people with uh, a number of skills and talent that we don't have. So it cannot be done only by a few specialists. Uh, addressing the language barrier, we really need to reach out to people from other language regions. And finally, reaching out to young people, uh, the post-modern generation. I think this is critical and it is key to mobilizing health workers for uh, global uh, missional health care in the future. Uh, and we will look a little more on that a little later. So we had a, a, a panel discussion from people from around the globe uh, to exactly ask the question, how are they doing, uh, how are they mobilizing uh, workers for missional health care? So I just want to share with you uh, some of the lessons that we learned from the, in uh, Arusha, uh, Dr. Wei Leong Go, he's the ICMD Secretary for Southeast Asia, and he shared, he talked about issue based groups. So after the conference in Bali in 1991, I think, or is it later, uh, young people started coming uh, and they formed issue based groups. Now the groups are on WhatsApp and uh, they exchange ideas and various concerns that is on their mind. And some of the groups are like groups on unreached people, reaching out to unreached people groups, creation care, and uh, diverse generation. How do we, uh, how does the generational perspectives on mission change? So out of them, out of this groups, creative new healthcare mission initiatives have come. One that was highlighted was the saving the rainforest with a stethoscope. And uh, he was of the opinion that uh, creation care and care for the environment, the importance of saving the planet is a crucial concern among many of the young health professionals today. And so it is something that we, we can't avoid talking about. And this is important. A participant from Germany who's working with the Frontier Church in Chad uh, mentioned that uh, the local church, his local church in Germany fosters good sending relationship among younger people with mission interests. So many of the new independent uh, churches, we find that uh, uh, there's a huge uh, youth group. Uh, a, lot, a lot of young people come to these churches and there is a lot of interest and that can be uh, if we try to mobilize people from these churches. But it's very important that the church is actively involved. Uh, participants from Sweden noted that there was a lack of training in cross-cultural healthcare mission. And that this was a major barrier in many European countries because of the effects of secularism and the declining church. Uh, so Dr. David Moe from UK works for the CMF uh, UK 
uh, talked about the decline uh, in medical missionaries, but he also talked about non-traditional marketplace workers. And that was a new uh, idea that, uh, and people actually questioned the statistics. When I put the statistics on the number of missionaries for Christians, they said it's very hard to measure that. And I totally agree with them because many people may be out there as uh, missionaries, but uh, not in the traditional sense, but as non-traditional marketplace workers. And this is an increasing trend. And as I mentioned that uh, with the uh, movement of labor across, we find that many Christians go to other countries to work. And this may be opportunities for them to be involved in mission. So actually the number of missionaries, the statistics would go up if we were to start looking at uh, these, this group of people. The other point I want to mention is when you look at missionaries sent by China, most of them don't go as uh, full-time missionaries sent by a mission organization, but most of them go, especially to the Middle East as non-traditional marketplace workers. So you may find them in different kinds of, uh, uh, in the supermarket or somewhere, but actually they're there as Christians and they want to be involved in mission work. Sorry, uh, spelling mistake. David Moe also mentioned that there were a few disruptors for global mission that he noted, especially among young people. Uh, they were questioning the links between mission and colonization. And this has come up increasingly after the uh, Black Lives Matter movement and the ideas of uh, white savior, saviorism and intersectional uh, ideas about health, the importance of linking health with poverty and social issues. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, brought out the reality that not all people, even within a country, had access. And there was a differential treatment of people within the healthcare systems. And this is something that they're concerned about. There is also an increased concern about the environment and about the air travel emissions as missionaries go across, especially uh, short-term missions and its implication on an environment. Dr. Verghese Philip from the Christian Medical sorry, the Medical Aviation Fellowship MAF mentioned that there were three categories of countries. One is those with problems of access due to conflict or visa restrictions where health personnel may be permitted to enter. And so this was an opportunity. Uh, then there are countries with human resources willing to go out, uh, especially to the Cat One, Category One countries, but where the churches are not willing to support or send health professionals or they lack the finances or the systems or mission organizations. And the third is countries with the financial uh, capability, the training, the organizational resources, but where people are not considering long-term mission as an option. So he saw the need to have a platform to share resources and harness the potential of Christians around the globe. So essentially he was talking about the idea of North-South partnership. Uh, Dr. Daniel O'Neill talked about the historical reversal of mission movements, even within countries. Uh, I just wanted to finish a few ideas. One, uh, when I was looking at this idea, I, I discovered there are something like 18, 20 uh, Christian medical colleges in Asia, all started by uh, various mission organizations. So if you look at South Korea, uh, there's supposed to be five uh, Christ, uh, colleges of medicine which were founded by Christian missionaries. Uh, one of the earliest colleges was in uh, South Korea in 1885. And of course, it was not South Korea then, but uh, in Korea. And then Malaysia, Singapore, and then even in Indonesia, there are some, and some recently started in 2001, uh, a university that uh, even Peter 
has visited, that is the Pelita Harappan University, and they are huge, and they train a large number of Christian uh, health workers. Again, Philippines, there are three. These are different uh, churches. Some are Catholic. Uh, if you come to India, there are uh, seven. Some people tell me there are eight. But uh, so there are different, uh, even the Orthodox Church has started two uh, Christian uh, medical colleges. So this, uh, if you just do a, a quick mathematics, even if they're 18 to 22, somewhere around that, even if there were only uh, 20 colleges and each of them produces 100 doctors, you have like 2000 doctors a year. And if you mobilize even 10% of them, we would have something like 200 doctors. And if you increase the scope to nurses, dentists, physiotherapists, nutrition workers, uh, then you widen the net. And then if you move beyond uh, from uh, and have uh, address, go to Christian student conferences, bringing in all kinds of students, for example, in Shiloh, now we have a missions conference in Velo, uh, where every year thousands of students uh, participate. In, in Nigeria, at the Christian Medical Dental Association, my friend Ozimoto said there were something like 2,000 students sometimes, somewhere between 1,000 to 2,000 students who come every year. So I think... Uh, if you even if you uh, look in Asia and Africa, there are a lot of opportunities that we can uh, mobilize people from these uh, mission colleges. So in a way, the seeds were sown much earlier, but now uh, we can move on. And so I just come to the final slides on mobilizing uh, workers for global mission. So today, the important thing is mission is from anywhere to anywhere. It's important to engage the church both in the south and also in the north. The call to mission must be for the whole church and it is necessary to mobilize the whole church and not only health professionals. Even if it is missional healthcare, we need uh, people with different skills and talents. Churches need to be brought back into the center of mission mobilization. Uh, the churches initially started and then the mission organization and societies were formed and slowly uh, there was a, a drift away from churches. Uh, traditional medical mission, there has to be a shift from traditional medical mission to missional health care in the sense that it's not only about uh, reaching out, but there has to be a connection between uh, God's mission, the global mission, and what we do as healthcare professionals. There must be a global process for meaningful collaboration between the churches, mission organizations in the global north and the global south. As uh, Dr. Vergis Philip put it, there needs to be a platform where all of them can come together. It's necessary to engage and work with the new and emerging churches. Uh, like the Pentecostal churches in Africa and Asia. Uh, there must be a willingness to go with tried models. I mean, there are some well-established mo models that we have over the century, and they have been effective. So it's not about doing away with them, but allow God's spirit to guide us to accept newer models. With the scope of medical or healthcare missions broadening, we need to go beyond healthcare professionals. Uh, as healthcare missionaries, we must connect with other, there must be uh, uh, intersectoral uh, link to care for creation and other mission movements like the International Justice Mission. And this idea of using social media influencers. Many people today, marketing is done by a group of people called social media influencers. And this can be a strategy and we need to follow up uh, young people after conferences and after meetings. We have a lot of conferences and people come together, but then after the conference or after the training program, what happens? So we need a strategy 
on how we using social media we can influence people's decision making uh missional healthcare leaders need to engage with other spirit led movements and to establish important linkages and networks uh, what i was thinking was like the recent ashbury revival and uh movements like that which revivals that come in different places from time to time how can we link with these movements to mobilize workers uh i just want to end by putting out some questions for reflection uh should organizations like icmd and other mission organizations fellowship move beyond that traditional membership from doctors and dentists and open it to all christians who require fellowship and wish to be missional how do we facilitate a platform for north south partnership and mobilize christian health workers from the south how do we reach and mobilize the post modern young students and professionals for global mission is there time for a paradigm shift in the engagement of healthcare professionals in global mission thank you and that's the end of my presentation thank you very much anil and and thanks that was really a great big picture overview anil uh just uh a couple of questions uh, firstly andrew tompkins has asked he says thank you very much for your analysis could you please share some of your insights into how christian healthcare workers in better off better resource countries can support their national colleagues in resource poor countries especially by internet communications please and i think we're all, we're all concerned also about uh members perhaps the younger generation thinking there's no place now for people from well resourced countries in healthcare mission because of the link between colonization and white saviorism and all that kind of stuff so uh, could you could you answer andrew's question some of your insights into how those in better off countries can support national colleagues in resource poor countries i think the global north has been involved in uh, global mission for over two centuries and uh, there is a lot of experience a lot of good practice there are a lot of systems that have been established over years uh, just to give you an example when uh, shalini and i were trying to go to south sudan we approached many uh, mission organizations uh, even in asia and most of them said we don't have the expertise or we don't have the systems we don't know how to uh, send people out for global missions so i think there has to be a sharing at the mission organizational levels at the organization and things like trainings uh, capacity building of people capacity building of organizations for example uh, we, one of the organizations we approached was cms uh, asia based in singapore and they said we don't we have never sent people out to africa so uh, if cms asia i mean uk could help build the capacity of cms asia that would be a great way then uh, they would be able to provide a mechanism for uh, people from singapore or hong kong or uh, southeast asia or even india to go out as missionaries right now there's a big struggle and uh, so and also i as i mentioned finances is an issue because many of the young churches the independent churches don't have the financial resources so they need us there needs to be some partnership and finance sharing uh, but that more than that i was thinking of capacity building in uh, asia africa south america how that can be uh, the training programs the mobilization uh, and the systems but finances of course and also to uh, okay. not we are not talking of shifting from global north to global south but we are talking of essentially a partnership so th that brings people from all across to work together and i i think that's important yeah. uh, peter i didn't get the question about the challenges you were talking about 
No, thank you. I, I think you've you've answered answered that question. Um, just on the question of North South partnerships, Anil, are there any best practice models that you can mention or, or um, signpost us to where uh, those in the North have really helped those in the South to mobilize? I, I was really struck by your uh, report from the ICMDA World Congress with the three types of countries and, and I think it was number two and three, one who have the resources but no will and those who have the will but no resources. So any best practice models you can you can highlight that you're aware of? Actually, I'm afraid I, I don't have any. Uh, this, this dialogue and talk about North-South partnership has been going on for quite a while. I think it's almost 20 years uh, since we've been talking about it. it uh, in the ICM day, it came out uh, in the Sydney conference. Uh, I've participated in uh, many of the, it was brought up in the Lausanne conference. Even uh, recently, it was brought in by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rebecca Naylor from the Baptist Convention. But uh, I think we have not really moved forward to actually build anything concrete. So I don't, I'm afraid I don't have any best practices or good practice. There may be some uh, individual isolated uh, examples, but nothing uh, larger or bigger in capacity. I mean, uh, we, we get supported by, as individuals, Shalini and I, for example, get supported by churches in, uh, and Christian organizations in UK, Canada. And uh, um, so we finance primarily by, uh, from the US and uh, other countries. And I'm sure there are many like us, but these are individual uh, examples. And I, I'm hesitant to call them like best practices because uh, not every young person would be willing to uh, follow our example. Thank you. Well, uh, of course, a, a lot of what ICMDA tries to do is to strengthen national associations of Christian doctors and dentists and bring together people across cultural, financial and uh, ethnic uh, boundaries to be able to help and build up one another. So uh, if you don't know about our uh, international diploma in family medicine uh, or about the training tracks that we run on things like leadership and uh, global health, uh, evangelism and apologetics, uh, bioethics, then uh, lots more information on our website. Uh, just, just to mention a couple I'm, of initiatives I'm aware of uh, that have started in the UK uh, and the, the US. One of them is a, is a group called 500K, which has a vision to mobilize Indian pastors and church planters. The money is all raised uh, in the UK, but it, it's uh, given to support and pay the salaries of church planters and pastors in in India, of course, many more can be mobilized than having to support people crossing cultural boundaries with all the expenses of training and relocation and so on from the West. Another very similar one in Africa I'm aware of is the mission Africans Reaching Africans, uh, Africans Reaching Africans, ARA, which is working right across the Sahel region in, in Africa and mobilizing local nationals who already have the, the language and the culture to be able to move both uh, uh, within their culture and across cultures in the Sahel region. So I think things are starting to, to happen. We've, uh, we've had a number of comments on the, the chat from Mike Soderling. Mike is the director or the coordinator or I think he'd call himself the co-catalyst for Lausanne's Health for All Nations movement and a uh, frequent uh, participant in, in the webinars. And uh, we'll put a link to that when we write to you uh, tomorrow. We'll also send you a link to the website, uh, a PDF of the presentation that we've heard from Anil and any other useful links as well. So please do use those resources going forward and let's keep the conversation going. This is such an important area. There's been mentions in our discussion and chat 
for more of a global platform to discuss these crucial issues. And we, we hope that ICMDA can be one of those global platforms through our, uh, through our webinars, through our internet uh, training, and also through the regional events and conferences that we're running that bring people together. So Anil, thank you so much again for your time today. Uh, apologies for the, oh, you wanted just to add something, yeah? Yeah, I just want to say I was, uh, wasn't was thinking uh, straight, but I must mention that the new initiatives that ICMDA on the mission uh, training programs, I think that is an excellent start. And I must mention that uh, Mike's work with the, uh, bringing together the issue-based network on health and the formation. I already mentioned some of them in my presentation of formation yeah. of the Christian journal. There is also a, a center for good practice. Uh, so uh, really when I was saying that there were uh, very few good practice, what I really meant was that the actual linkages that were established at the ground, I mean, in terms of using technology and training, yes, we are now trying to expand and reach other areas. And of course, as I mentioned in my talk, the moving across language barriers uh, into uh, other languages. The fact that we have about uh, four different language translations today uh, is, is a fact that we are trying to reach across. Uh, but I just wanted to finish by, by saying reaching out to young people, I think, is the big challenge. Yeah. Well, it's a great note to finish on. And, and thanks again, Anil, for your time and experience and your talk and questions today. And to all of you for coming along and participating through your questions and listening, and just for hanging in there today through the technological difficulties we've had. We're, we're really grateful for your presence. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and we'll see you soon on ICMDA webinars. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.